And there, count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Uh, there's a real remedy for grumbling, and that is to stop and consciously, intentionally count the blessings of God. We have one of them sitting among us. I'm trying to remember the last time that I preached to a human being three and a half days old. It's been a while, I think. So I've really got to step up and try to keep Ember engaged, and I'll do the best I can. And by the way, when the, when the sermon's over, if I look and see her resting, then I will rejoice to know that she was comforted by what I had to say. Turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. I told you a few weeks ago that I was just kind of reflecting through, uh, grateful for the celebration that we've had. You, you, I hope you realize that there, there are evangelical conservative churches across the land who, who didn't even acknowledge the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Some of my own Baptist friends uh, chafe against that, mistakenly, I believe. And they, are, they fall into the mistaken error that my dear, precious mother did that I told you about. And my mother told me to fill out my standardized form, not Protestant, not Catholic, but other, and then write Baptist in it. Right? Uh, and I'm, I'm thankful to the Lord for all that she taught me, but I'm thankful that I was taught better as I, as I grew up particularly indebted to Dr. Tom Nettles, who was my uh, history professor, church history professor in seminary, and opened my eyes to see the things more clearly. And so I told you at the time we might come back, and I was trying to think, how do we, how do we tie this together? And it seemed to me the better part of wisdom to, on the, on the Sunday as we head toward Thanksgiving Day, uh, that that I give thanks and ask you to join me in giving thanks uh, for our Baptist heritage. 1 Peter 2, 1 to 10 is the passage I want to read, and you'll understand a little later why we're reading that. Stand with me if you would. I hope you found that in your Bibles. And if you don't have a Bible with you, we've got the text on the screen for you because as we've said many times, if all you do is listen to me, you will miss a lot. I want you to engage, to engage. And one of the ways you can engage is to see the scriptures that we read and let them speak to you, to your heart, to your ears, to your eyes. Follow along as I read this, please. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you or a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What have we read together? This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And may the Lord use this to challenge us again about the, about the core of biblical Christianity, which is a believer's church, a church made up of members, only those members 
who give evidence of a saving encounter with Jesus Christ that is transforming their lives, never to be the same. Thank you. Please be seated. In 1876, John Quincy Adams, not the sixth president of the United States, but someone named after him, who was a former Pedo Baptist, in other words, a, who came out of a situation where sprinkling children was considered orthodox. And he turned and embraced Baptist convictions, authored a book entitled Baptists, The Only Thorough Religious Reformers. Now, I do not want this message to appear sectarian, as if, as if we're dismissing our brothers and sisters in Christ who differ with us on this. In fact, we've spent six weeks Sunday morning and Sunday evening showing otherwise. We thank God for Martin Luther and all those who went before him, uh, Wycliffe, Jan Hus, all those who stood beside him, uh, Melanchthon, Calvin, Zwingli, all who came after him. We thank God for them. God used them to recover the gospel out of the, out of the death grip clutches of Roman Catholicism. However, when you study them, there is a reason that we are different. I grew up in a Baptist church. I was just de facto of Baptist leanings because my mama took me to church probably about the age of Ember. I don't know. Maybe she waited a little while. I think when I was born, it was the people, they were all panicky. Oh my goodness, keep them away from people. But, but I promise you, as soon as my mother thought it was right to do, she had me there. Cradle roll. In fact, I've told you parenthetically that my mother, Karen's born three days before me. Uh, yes, I married an older woman, but that's another discussion another time. My mother took me to church the same time that Karen's mother took her. When my mother went to pick me up, when I was a little thing, I didn't weigh but four pounds, 15 ounces when I was born. Someone said, well, you've made up for lost time. I've certainly tried to do so. They handed my mother, Karen, by mistake. We have much better, just much better nursery implementation in place here, by the way. We don't give away children mistakenly. And she gave her back. But through the years, when I, as I was growing up and I, and I would get into mischief, which happened occasionally, she would say to me, I never should have given back that dunchy girl. So the night we got married, standing in the receiving line, I leaned to her and I said, Mom, you finally got that dunchy girl you've been wanting all these years. So we were, we were growing up in that thing. I was, uh, some people say I was Baptist born, Baptist bred, and when I die, I'll be, I'll be Baptist dead. But you can't be born a Baptist, and you'll understand why in a few minutes, but born into that setting, and I was. And I grew up because it was convenient. I didn't know anything else and never, never thought to look. And when I got into seminary, I began to have to think seriously and deeply about my Baptist roots. In fact, I came to a crisis out of seminary where I thought I was becoming a Presbyterian by a major doctrinal shift that took place in my life. My friend Tom Nettles, who'd been my professor then, said, well, you need to take my book, Baptist in the Bible, which I know you've read, I know you have it, and go look at the bibliography and search out those sources. And so, in my 20s, I moved from being a Baptist by convenience or just a Baptist by default to being a Baptist by conviction. And so this is not about denominational snobbery today. This is about taking sola scriptura, one of, the, one of the foundational principles coming out of the Reformation, and following it to its biblical conclusion on the subject of salvation, but particularly what constitutes a true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting to me because the Puritans, the, the, the Reformers and then the Puritans after them, and you 
reformers were in the 16th century. The Puritans were their heirs and came out of the 17th century. You would, if you know church history, you know that they were Anglicans and Presbyterians. Had a way of talking about the marks of a true church. Listen to this now. There were three marks of a true church. The first was the authoritative preaching of the Word of God. So a, a people gathered under the authoritative preaching of the Word of God. If the Word of God is not central, if the Word of God is not believed, then it doesn't matter how ornate it is, how many good things they do, they have no right to be called a true church, according to the Reformers and then the Puritans. The second was the biblical administration of the sacraments, they would call them. We, in the, in the Baptist tradition, we use the term ordinance because sacraments are used to imply saving elements. But sacraments is an okay word if it's used understandably. It's a, it's a holy, set-aside observation. And of course, we recognize those, as does all the church around the world, uh, as, as baptism and the Lord's Supper. But a biblical administration of those. Okay. Then the third mark was the biblical administration of redemptive, corrective church discipline. So according to the Reformers and according to the Puritans, and all who come out of that and appreciate being heirs of that, a true church is marked by these things, bare minimum. Authoritative preaching of the Word of God, believing it's inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient, preaching it as such, pressing it to your own life and the lives of others to live out the gospel and its implications. Second, the administration according to the Scripture of baptism in the Lord's Supper. And then third, the administration of corrective church discipline. John Owen, considered the prince of the Puritans, said, speaking of, of, of Peter, that this, this living head, Jesus Christ, will not admit any dead members into the spiritual temple he is building. And that's fascinating to me because he's exactly right. But he said that, John Owen did, as a Puritan within the Church of England, practicing the sprinkling of infants into membership. I just look at that and I think the best of men are at their best just men. Blessed inconsistencies. But what he said was right. You see, Baptists embrace, at least in principle, a believer's church that anyone is welcome to sit among us and hear the gospel preached because we believe that the preaching of the word is one of the means God uses to draw the unsaved unto Christ. But not just anyone can be or should be welcomed as a member into a Baptist church. Because you see, we read the scripture, we read these passages like 1 Peter 2, 1 to 10. Look at this with me just real quick. I want to draw some things to, out to you. Look at verse 2. As newborn infants, Baptists embrace the biblical teaching of the new birth, the doctrine of regeneration. We believe Jesus, when he looked at Nicodemus and said, you must be born again before you can see the kingdom before you can enter the kingdom. Without the new birth, no one should be allowed to identify himself or herself as a Christian. Look at on down in this passage. Look at verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone. Verse 5. You yourselves like living stones. Living there is no place in membership, make a distinction, between sitting in the setting where the gospel is preached, but no place in membership for a person who is yet dead in trespasses and sins. Living stones are being built up in verse 5 as a spiritual house, not, not a natural, not a carnal, a spiritual house. People who have who have been enlivened spiritually. 
a holy priesthood. People who've been set apart by the grace of God, the power of God in the gospel, and are being sanctified, being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ to offer spiritual sacrifices, Romans 12. Stop being conformed. Keep on being transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may present to God spiritual sacrifices. Look at verse 7. So the honor, this honor of being identified with him who is the living stone, who is the, the cornerstone, the honor is for you who believe. For those who do not believe, and it's a, it's a very terrible warning about those who are destined to be destroyed because they do not believe. Verse 9, but you... Here's the contrast. Unbelievers will be destroyed, but you, believers, are a chosen race. The only way you can explain why you are in Christ is because in eternity past, he set his heart upon you. A royal priesthood. You remember the story about the boy who was at Buckingham Palace and was looking into the gate and wanting to go in and a man walked up to him and said, uh, you're doing young man. He said, I just wanted to see the queen and I have no way to do that. The man said, well, I'm the queen's son. Come with me. You see, we're royal. We, we're bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Royal blood. A royal priesthood. A, a gathering of people dedicated, committed to God. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you. There, we, we are summoned saints. He summons us savingly. Called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then the final word that once there's been a major change. You see, sprinkling an infant doesn't bring a change to that person's life. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. A passage like this, the Scripture is replete with passages that emphasize the new birth, emphasize conversion, emphasize salvation, emphasize all these things leading into membership. Jesus himself commissioned his disciples, as you go, Make disciples, Matthew 28, closing verses. Make disciples, make students of me from all the people groups. And as these disciples become students, as these, these people become students of Jesus, followers of Jesus, then they are to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they should events a teachable spirit, willing to learn all the things that the Lord has commanded. Say something. There are exceptions, I'm sure. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I don't know people's hearts. Let me tell you something. A person who claims to be a Christian, a member of a Baptist church, and has no heart to gather with the people of God. When the church gathers, when Christ loved the church and gave himself for the church, person that has no heart to be a part of that, has no reason, no biblical reason to consider himself or herself a Christian. That's not Bill Askell the Baptist, that's the scripture saying that. Hebrews 10 warns, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Be warned for the day is approaching and the day there is the day of judgment. You see, Baptists have had historically deep convictions. Now, I've got to confess to you. Baptists today many times don't hold these convictions. And when they don't, they're sinning. Baptists in typical churches, and our church is not typical, thank God. We have, we've addressed the matter of membership 
moving toward what we call meaningful membership or biblical membership. But do you realize that in many churches, a setting like this of this many people would probably have a membership of hundreds, 500 or more? Because we've lost this key Baptist distinctive of a regenerate church membership. That's why I said to you back when we were going through these studies on the Reformation, we need a new Reformation. Baptists need a new Reformation. We need to recover the gospel. I've been a part of something since 1983 that was started called Founders Ministries. When we met that first time, praying, planning, wondering what might happen. It was to recover the gospel in local churches and to see local churches restored to their biblical position. And that's been going on 34 years. And God's blessing, by the way. We're seeing amazing things. But it's a long way to go. So hear me now. This book that John Quincy Adams wrote, I would commend it to you. It's available in a digital copy. If you want a copy of it, you can speak to Linda, text or email, call me. We'll send it to you in digital format. But there were six things that Adams points out in that book that he says, and I, I agree with him, show Baptists having carried the Reformation to its biblical conclusion. Again, I'm not being unkind to others. I'm simply saying I love them in the gospel. When my Presbyterian friends, or my Anglican friends, look up and realize that their membership is cluttered with unconverted people, I say this with tenderness. It's because they have practiced their doctrine of the church. Where they've admitted people into membership before they were Give evidence of being converted. When a Baptist pastor, though, looks up and realizes that the congregation he pastors is cluttered with unconverted people, people living as if they've never known Christ, it's because he has failed to practice the biblical doctrine of the church which says that only those who give evidence of a saving encounter with Jesus, who are being transformed by His grace, who have new appetites, appetites for God, not the world. That when God and the world compete, the world doesn't win out. Because there's a devotion for God. There is what John Piper calls a desiring God. A Baptist pastor has failed to practice a historic Baptist biblical position on church and church membership. Let's not take this seriously. And I'm grateful. I want to make a distinction here. I was a Baptist by convenience for years. But I've told you before about my testimony. I was unconverted as a Baptist church member for 10 years. That church, my home church, failed to practice their Baptist distinctive on membership. And I made a determination when the Lord made it clear He wanted me to enter the ministry that God being my helper, I would not be that way. It would mean something, not because I'm a snobbish Baptist. I tell folks all the time, the Baptist world is my backyard. It needs cleaning up as much as any place does. But I don't pretend that everybody's doctrine of the church lines up with Scripture. I want to point out to you just a few things today. Some distinctives we have. We have many things in common with the evangelical world. We believe the Scripture is authoritative. We believe, believe that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. We believe that God exists in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that man is 
sinful by nature. We believe that salvation is only found in Jesus Christ. It is by grace through faith. Jesus lived, died, and rose again. It's coming again. That we're justified only by faith. We, there are many things we believe together. And plenty of things in which I can fellowship in the gospel. But there are distinctives that make me grateful for my Baptist heritage. First of all, the exaltation of the Word of God above tradition. The exalting of the Word of God above tradition. Baptists historically have said, what says the Scriptures? Now, you know as well as I do, if you've lived in Baptist life, that there, there, there is this... Uh, what someone called the seven last words of the church. You know, we've never done it that way before. You know, there are traditions that, that happen in, in Baptist life, but they should always serve the Scriptures, never replace the Scriptures. And when they do replace the Scriptures, then that is counter to our Baptist heritage. Jesus chided the religious leaders of his day in Matthew 15, 6, so for the sake of your tradition, you've made void the Word of God. Baptists believe that. Baptists believe that everything, every aspect of a life of a church ought to be slid under the microscope of Scripture. Does it line up with it? it? Keeps us in check. You don't have to go very far to find places that are, that are that's a lot of pomp and circumstance, a lot, of, a lot of tradition about it. That's not the Baptist way because it's not the biblical way. Second, the recognition of the spirituality of Christ's kingdom. It advances by evangelism, not procreation, not force, not political power. Parenthetically, let me say that anyone who wants to suggest to you that Islam is a religion of peace should look at how they advance it and have always advanced it by the sword, spilt blood. Our gospel is not that way. Jesus said in John 18, 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. It's a spiritual kingdom. It advances like seed sown. We sang a while ago, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the blade. That's how the, the gospel advances. Evangelism. We sow. A man went out to sow, Jesus said. He sowed promiscuously. And while there were bad results to that, there were good results. The multiplication where the seed fell on fertile soil. We don't need the power of Washington to advance our cause. We do tremble sometimes when we see freedoms that we've had being eroded. It's troublesome. But I remind you, brothers and sisters in Christ, that where the gospel is advancing like wildfire is where the people have the least political freedom. We don't need that. It'd be wonderful to have a Supreme Court filled with judges who recognize the constitutional priority. But we don't need that to advance our cause. We don't need our man in the White House. We don't need our majority in the Senate and the House. We need to be faithful to share the gospel, to sow and pray and trust the Lord of the harvest. It's a spiritual kingdom, and it only and always advances that way. In fact, one of the darkest times in the church is when Constantine, who became impressed with Christianity, don't know if he was really saved or not, but he became impressed, and he adopted it. He embraced it as the official uh, religion of the empire, had all of his soldiers baptized. They marched underneath, and they were sprinkled by the clergy. And we were plunged into the Dark Ages, which necessitated several hundred years later, the Reformation.
Third, the propagation of religious liberty and liberty of conscience. In other words, a free church and a free land. Our, the, the Puritans and separatists left England to come here to get out from the heavy thumb of the king because the king, the state, and the church were wed together in England. Still are, by the way. They came over here to be able to worship God according to the dictates of their conscience, which meant they protected the right of those, ultimately protected the right of those who didn't want to worship God. But it was not to be coerced. A free Baptist religious freedom. The first Baptist recognized in this country was banished because he dared to preach in the colonies that the conscience ought to be free to worship God. Now that opens up a can of worms because if you just worship God as you imagine him, it's like you're off the beam. But they would defend that right because they didn't have that right in England. Roger Williams paid a great price. In fact, historically, you need to know this. The Baptists have paid a great price even among our friends who are heirs of the Reformation. William Kiffin in England, one of the Baptist forefathers, debated a, a man named Featley who was a very intelligent, articulate, educated man on what is a true church. And Featley spoke about the dippers, get that? We go immersion. The dippers dipped. We plunged their their arguments beneath the water. If you read about our Baptist forefathers, you'll know that some were arrested. The authorities who were influenced by Anglicanism and Presbyterianism said, if you're all so fired up about immersion, let us treat you to immersion. We'll tie stones around their necks and throw them into the Thames River and drown them. It was a great price paid historically. We cannot, we must not yawn through our heritage. In Luke 9, 49 and 50, John said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. In other words, he didn't have our imprimatur. Jesus said, do not stop him. For the one who's not against you is for you. Liberty of conscience, a great hallmark of Baptist. Fourth, the establishment of equality among Christ's disciples, the priesthood of all believers. The priesthood of all believers. If you're saved by grace through faith here today, we read in 1 Peter that you are a holy priesthood. You personally, but you don't stand personally. You don't stand individually. You don't stand apart from. A priesthood means that there's a collection, a gathering of people who come together. And the churches out of the Reformation, of course, there were priests, there were prelates, there were all these levels, bishops, on and on and on. Baptists recognized, no. If I'm saved by grace through faith and you're saved by grace through faith, we are on equal footing at the cross and we are joint heirs. You're as much a child of God as I am. I'm as much a child of God as you are. We don't have ranks in Baptist life because the Scripture doesn't teach it. Matthew 23, 8. You're not to be called rabbi, Jesus says, for you have one teacher and you're all brothers. Baptists believe that. Now you may not believe, be convinced, but you are equal in this congregation. Your input, your thoughts are as valuable as anybody's here. Your service is as necessary as anybody's here. Your faithfulness is, is a key to our functioning as a healthy congregation. Not because we're trying to coerce, manipulate, because we believe that when you're saved by grace through faith and you join a local congregation, we constitute a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And we are more effective when we come together to offer to God than we are when we try to do it on our own, by ourselves. Fifth, the establishment of the correct principle of biblical translation in the common tongue of the people. In Habakkuk 2, 2, the Lord answered and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that he may run who reads it. 
Baptists believe that the Scripture is a fancy word used historically, the perspicuity of Scripture. Perspicuity. Five syllables, which is unfortunate because what it means is that the, the Bible is clear. <laughs> it's clear. The clarity, perhaps. Mark Twain said, it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts of the Bible that I do understand. The Bible is clear. and can be taken in the common language of the people and read to one's benefit if they're seeking Jesus Christ in the Scriptures. Remember I told you in the Reformation, one of the concerns of the Pope's men was that they said, if, if if this keeps going on, before you know it, everybody will be reading the Bible for himself. That's a Baptist ideal and desire, that everybody read the Scripture for himself. Then sixth, the restoration of the order of primitive churches, a believer's church made up only of those who give evidence of being regenerate. Acts 2.41, those who received his word, received it, made an impact, it gripped them, it changed them, were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000. Acts 2, 47, they were praising God and having favor with all the people. The Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. It is the distinction. God being my helper, you need to know this. However much longer God has me here, we will not knowingly admit into membership or into the waters of baptism anyone who doesn't give evidence of having been born again. It won't happen. We'd be sinning against them, sinning against you, sinning against the Lord and His Word. But by the same token, we welcome all to come and confess faith in Jesus Christ. We're not a, we're not a secret club here. We don't have a secret handshake. We're out in the open. Any who will repent of their sins and trust in Jesus Christ will be saved. And anyone saved is welcome. If they follow the Lord in baptism, they can come and be a part of this assembly. It's beautiful. I'm thankful to God that He didn't let me live my life just complacent, being a Baptist because that's what I was born into. But I'm thankful that in His providence, He did put me in that position to begin with. I don't know what background you come from. It really doesn't matter. If you're saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. But if you want to bring the Reformation to its biblical conclusion, sola scriptura fleshed out, it will take in these principles. Now, it's not the name, Baptist. There are Bible churches. There are plenty of church gatherings across the world, across this nation, who practice the things that we've talked about today who may not call themselves Baptists, but they are, they are Baptistic. They recognize the order. Salvation, following Jesus in immersion, joining a local church, visible expression of Jesus, laboring together with that, not by convenience, but by conviction, not when it fits my schedule, but when I want to fit into God's schedule. That's carrying the Reformation to its biblical conclusion. And as much as I love Reformation go-befores, they stop short. Martin Luther never could cut himself loose from Roman Catholic infant baptism. John Calvin never could cut himself loose from Roman Catholic infant baptism. And their doctrine of the church, with all that we can learn from them, their doctrine of the church is skewed. So you hear me say, if you've talked to me about reading, I'll say, look, you can read this person, but be careful when you get to the subject of the church and church membership. He's not a safe guide there. It's just recognizing the value that the Puritans bring to many discussions, many, many doctrines. But I thank God that he raised up through the years men and women who saw the scripture, saw what it said, committed themselves to it even if it meant their life, and followed him. Now it's been handed to you. What will you do with it? 
You can ignore it. That's sin. You can fumble the ball. That's sin. You can say today, you know, I didn't know some of these things. But I'm going to investigate it more. Cultivate a gratitude. I'm a part of a church. Recognize that the scripture says that only people saved can be members of churches. And I'm going to flesh that out more consistently, more faithfully. And I'm going to share the gospel more frequently because that's the means God uses to advance his church. As you enter into this season of Thanksgiving, many things you're thankful for, I pray that somewhere, somehow, you'll take time to think and come to a position of gratitude. And in your gratitude, purpose to flesh out and show the Lord how great, how grateful you are. He is faithful. Great is his faithfulness. New mercies every day. If you're here and you're not yet saved, if you haven't become a follower of Jesus Christ, I just want to say to you that we welcome you to investigate that you'd like for us to pray for you about that, talk with you about that, let us know. If you're here and you want to plant your life here in a church that embraces the full-orbed expression of the Reformation in the recovery of the gospel, you want to apply for membership, just present yourself, let, you, let us know that today. And we'll set into motion the process, which will show to you as we talk through it that we really mean what we say. We don't simply trifle with membership. We practice the biblical model and measure of membership in this church. Let's stand together and sing before we are dismissed. Stand up.